Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the second day of Christmas. I am sure that you added two turtle doves to the partridge and pear tree that you gave to your loved ones uh, yesterday. Uh, we often forget that that traditional song of the holiday refers to the 12 days beginning with Christmas into the new year, the celebration of Epiphany, and not the 12 days before. So we have gathered in our continuing celebration of God's gift, the gift of his son Jesus, and all that accompanies that gift, and we invite you uh, to be worshiping with us today. Uh, just one uh, quick announcement. Uh, with the rise, unfortunately, of uh, COVID again in the area, uh, we are not going to be doing the greeting uh, during the service, and I will be masked up and kind of greeting you without the handshakes in the back of the uh, sanctuary. Uh, we will still be having a coffee hour. Uh, we trust we will be uh, responsible uh, with that if you have any of the symptoms. Uh, you know, don't get up and grab your neighbor and give them a hug uh, over a cookie and a cup of coffee, uh, but together we will uh, get through this. But today is indeed a day of a celebration. I invite you to join me uh, in the call to worship this morning. God's love has come to earth to dwell with us. We are God's chosen people, loved and cherished. The birth of love has changed us forever. Let us sing, praise, rejoice, and worship together. Let us pray. Father, we come once again into the presence of your throne. We come once again in celebration, remembering the gift of Jesus, looking forward to his coming again, and filling the moments in between with overflowing joy. Father, send your spirit upon us that our hearts may be knit together in this celebration. And may we now indeed join our voices with the voices of angels above singing your praise. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Let's stand together. Angels, we have heard on high.
when the light shines, it exposes many things that we tried to hide away in the darkness. When the light of Christ's love shines into our lives, we realize that we are not the good people, perhaps, that we thought we were. That there were things cluttering the corners of our minds, uh, hiding within the depths of our hearts, uh, that once they are exposed, they need to be cleaned up. God has provided us the means to do that through the confession of sin. I invite you to join me in this unison prayer. Lord, it's only the day after the Christmas celebration, and we're exhausted. People have come and gone. Gatherings are winding down. We are being reminded of the normalcy of life returning to us. We don't want to go there just yet. We want to linger in the warmth of the season. Forgive us when we don't seem to feel your warmth in our lives all the time. Forgive us when we assign warmth only to Christmas and then to Easter and seem to dwell on the mundane the rest of the time. Give us courage to live as people of the light those who find your comforting, encouraging presence in our lives at all times. Strengthen us for joyful service in your name. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. People of God, feel the presence of God right now in this place, warming your hearts, forgiving your sin, preparing you for joyful service. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are beloved and forgiven. So much of Advent is spent in preparation, trying to do too much in too little time, that we need this gift of extra time. When we are not worried about getting things done, but now, like Mary, we might wonder at the gift of Jesus. We might hear again the song of angels above the secular cry of commercialism. We might, like the wise men, seek out the star that brings us to where you want us to be. We stand on the cusp of a 
of a new year. Yet a change of calendar does not change our circumstance. We wish that it did, that we would have a, a clean slate. But Father, we know that many of the problems, many of the concerns that we dealt with in December will follow us into January. And so we need these moments of quiet reflection. We need to be reminded that the one who was born in Bethlehem remains with us. That the one who grew up in your sight, in the favor of men, the one who walked and taught and healed, is still among us today, tomorrow, and all the days that lie ahead. To sing Emmanuel is not to sing about one fixed point in time, and we come to the 25th, and on the 26th, you're gone. We know that you now are always with us. And so we rejoice that whatever the day holds, whatever the future has in store, we do not make the journey alone, but we do it with you as our shepherd, as our guide. We thank you, Lord, that you have continued to pour out gifts upon your children. Every day is a gift of your grace, your love, and your mercy. May we open it and may we enjoy it to the full, knowing that on the next day there is a new gift to be opened. More moments of time that we can walk with you, that we can love our neighbors as ourselves, that we can extend grace and mercy to those in our lives. Father, we thank you for today. And we have hope for tomorrow. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and set aside. We, we pray that you would take this pandemic, Lord, and, and you would, by a word, whisk it away. That you would remove from us this thing that has prevented us from doing so much that we have wanted to do with one another and even within your church. Lord, we know that you hold all things in your hand and that you do all things well. And so we plead with you for those who are sick and set aside. We plead with you who are sorrowing this Christmas as they remember the loss of loved ones. We pray, Father, for those who the anxiety of preparation has taken away the joy of the celebration. We pray for those, Father, who still are in the darkness, that the light may shine, that their cold hearts would be warmed, and that they would see the one born in a manger is not myth, but he indeed is King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, bless those whom you have called your own. And as we are blessed, may we be a blessing to others, not only in the season of giving, but in the season that lies before us when so many forget the needs of others. Lord, may we carry the spirit of Christmas into all our days, even as we praise you, we glorify, and we honor you today. Now here are the prayers that we bring as we lay them before you with the words of Jesus saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is the birthday of the King. <laughs>
the word of God first this morning from the book of James. Just a single verse, James chapter 1, verse 17. This is the word of God. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. May God add his blessing to his holy and inspired word this morning. I guess I was about uh, 13 years old when Christmas kind of changed. Up to that point, I had had pretty good Christmases. Um, I got the toys, I got the, the gadgets, I got the all the, the fun things that you want as, as a child. But it was about my 13th birthday when I opened up the gifts, and instead of finding Toys, I found socks and underwear. And I remember looking at my mother with this kind of look, it's like, what? And she said, these are practical gifts. These are useful gifts. You need socks and underwear. And I think it really is kind of a rite of passage as, as, as we get older as we transition from, from childhood to uh, adolescence into our teenage years, uh, our boys are kind of in that transition period uh, when they're going from, from toys to, to socks and underwear, or in their case, uh, sweatshirts and, and, and pants. And I remember initially thinking, you know, yeah, this is kind of a bummer of Christmas until I needed a new pair of underwear. They were in my drawer. Until I stuck my uh, big toe through the toe of my sock and I needed to do a pair of socks. And I realized that my mother was absolutely right. Is that there comes a point in life that we need practical gifts. We need things that are, are useful for our day-to-day -day living. And those gifts are, are necessary. And they are given with as much love as all the other toys and things that we have received prior to that. So this week I was thinking about socks and underwear. We've just come out of the season of Advent, and we have been looking at the, the big gifts of God. The hope that we have that, that the future is, is in His hands. The, the peace that we have through Jesus between God and, and human hearts. The, the joy that is filling our lives not only at this season but throughout all the seasons of life and then we look at God's love this past week for God so loved the world he gave his son and those are big gifts those are the important gifts the church has recognized that for for thousands and thousands of years that these are the gifts we lift up and highlight at Christmas but I sat there thinking, these are not the only gifts that God has given us in the birth of Jesus. That God is a generous God and he gives us more than we ask. More than we deserve. He gives us sometimes, maybe not what we want, but what we need. And so today, just for, for a few moments together, I want to think about some of those socks and underwear gifts that God gives to us in the gift of His Son that maybe we don't realize we need. Or maybe we do. And we wonder where we find them. But we find these gifts throughout uh, the Scriptures. James says that God is the one who gives the, the perfect gift, the right gift, at just the right time when we need it most. But I want to lift up just a few of these uh, today, and we're going to use a nice simple acrostic if you're taking notes, G-I-F-T-S, five gifts, the sock and underwear gifts uh, of God. And the first one that I want to lift up 
is grace. Grace is a gift of God. What does it say? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not works so that no one can boast. Grace is a gift of Christians. Now, when I was a kid, one of the most frightening things for my parents was on Christmas morning when we would tear open the gift and there would be those dreaded words, batteries not included. My parents never remembered the batteries. And so we would go scrounging through every drawer. We would be uh, pulling things out of our, uh, you know, our, our radios, trying to have batteries. Because without batteries, the gift was useless. My mother-in-law, God rest her soul, understood that. And so every Christmas, and it was always kind of fun, she would uh, bring her gifts over for the, for the boys. And one of the first things they would get would be these little packages that weighed a whole lot. And they would rip them open in eager anticipation, and there would be a package of batteries from Grandma. And they kind of would go, well, what kind of gift is this? Until she handed them the next one. Tore it open, and there were the batteries to make the gift work. Now, why am I talking about that? Because sometimes we misunderstand what grace is. Sometimes when we think about grace, we think about God's uh, emotional attitude toward us. We think that grace has to do with God having uh, good feelings toward us, loving feeling towards us, peaceful feelings. But grace is not ultimately emotion. Grace is power. When the Bible talks about grace, it talks about the transforming power of this gift that God gives us. It gives us the ability, Titus says, to, to say no to temptation. Scripture says that grace gives us the ability to live the Christian life. And so when God gave us new life in Jesus Christ through the birth of his son, he just didn't say, okay, now go do it on your own. Go operate in your own strength. Go find your own batteries. Go find your own power cord. No, God provided that in the gift of grace. Grace is operative not only at the beginning of the Christian life. Grace doesn't just get you saved. Grace gets you up in the morning. Grace gets you along through the, the journey of life. Whatever the circumstance may be, you need that divine power to live out the life that God wants you to live. And that is the gift of grace. It is, in a sense, the, the batteries of the Christian life. It is the power that allows us to do the things that God asks of us. It allows us to love the unlovable. It allows us to forgive the, the unforgivable. It allows us to reach out to people on the margins, people that we probably would in our own strength never want anything to do with. Grace is the power that God gives us as a gift to live life to the full. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. How is that abundant life access? How is that abundant life energized? Through the daily gift of grace. Because grace is new every morning. Grace is operative when we need it most. He does not leave us powerless in the world. He has given to his children the gift of grace. Second gift is the gift of intimacy. Now I thought, how do I, how do I describe this, this gift of God? We read, you know, over in John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he, he gave his only son. And I started thinking about being in school as a young school child. And what would we do every week before Christmas, we would make gifts for mom and dad. When I was a kid, the ultimate gift mom and dad could get would be our hands stuck into plaster or clay. 
But I remember for a lot of years during those middle school years that what we did is we made a coupon book. Anybody remember those coupon books you made as a, as a child? You would make the coupon book, you would decorate it, and then you would add the coupon to say, good for one free hug, or good for one time helping with the dishes, or, or one time taking out uh, the garbage. And I remember uh, my mother finding some of those when I was moving out. She tried to get them all plain right before I went off to college. And I thought, you know, that really is what this gift of intimacy is. It is, it, it is a gift of, of connection. Because what we were promising in those little coupon books as children, that we wanted to be with mom and dad. We wanted to spend time with them, whether it was, you know, just sitting on their lap, giving them a hug, whether it was washing dishes beside mom, whether it was taking out garbage with dad. Those were moments when we connected in, in just wonderful ways. We wanted to be with mom and dad. And so God wants to be with us. Again, you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God did nothing long distance in our salvation. He could have easily sat up there at the throne and, and one Saturday morning could have looked out the sinful miss of man. He could have gone, okay, problem solved. But he didn't. He sent his son to come into this world, to be connected with us in a way that cannot be done from sitting in heaven on earth. Jesus came down, took on our flesh and blood. He assumed all of the, the characteristics. He went through all of the ages. Jesus probably experienced teenage acne. He probably you know, had those, you know, those moments of wondering and doubt. Yes, he was without sin, but he was like us. Because he wanted to get to know us. He wanted to enter into our experience so that he could speak to our experience. And literally, the scripture is a, a coupon book of the intimate things that God is offering to do with us, through us, and, and for us. And I think we ought not to forget that. That God is for us. And that is why Jesus was born. So he's given us grace to energize our walk with him. He has offered us intimacy to, to remind us that I want to be with you at all times, in all places, always with you. Now the third one this morning, I had originally uh, written my notes, and I had written down the word forever. And I'm sitting there reviewing my notes this morning, and it just didn't seem right. So I crossed out forever, and I wrote the word family. And I sat and I looked at that, and that didn't seem right either. So the Spirit said, why don't you just bring the two of them together? So the third gift, the sock and underwear gift of Christmas, is a forever family. Now that kind of means two things to me. It means, first of all, that he has given us one another. You know, there are some people who are estranged from their family. There are some people who do not have family near to them. But he's given us the church. He's given us the gift of, of God's family. On Christmas, I was uh, uh, getting my Facebook messages and, you know, from people here in, in town, people, uh, family and friends out in Iowa. But I also got... Uh, Christmas greetings from friends in, in Kenya and Uganda. I got a whole bunch of videos of the uh, orphans uh, having their Christmas dinner. And I realized that these guys are part of my family. I am as connected to Ezekiel Sang, the pastor in Kenya, as I am to any pastor in Douglas or Aurora County. Because of Jesus Christ, that's part of my family. You are part of my family. We are part of each other's 
family the family of God. So I thought, you know, that's important that God has given us. But then I started to think about the losses at Christmas. And I was reading the Queen's message. I'm a little odd that way. I either listen to or I read the Christmas message of Queen Elizabeth, the longest reigning monarch uh, in Britain. And whether you know or not, she lost her husband of 70 years, Philip. And this was the first Christmas that she was spending without Philip. And she was talking about loss of Christmas. She was talking about the loss of her beloved uh, husband. She was talking about the losses that we've incurred through COVID, through all the restrictions. But then she said something at the very end of her speech I want to share with you. She ended it this way. And for me and my family, even with one familiar laugh missing, this year, there will be joy in Christmas. In spite of the fact that there will be one familiar laugh missing, there will be joy in Christmas. And that, to me, tied it together. Because you and I are part of a forever family. Those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ have a wonderful gift. Romans says this, for the wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life. Many of you have suffered losses over the last little while. We, we grieve loved ones who are not with us this Christmas. But like the Queen, we can have joy because our family is a forever family. Because we will see those loved ones again. We will see those who have left us when we join them in eternity. And that's the, one of the greatest gifts to me of Christmas. It is a, a very necessary gift because it is easy to lose the joy of Christmas in our sorrow. My mother lost her father at Christmas time. Christmas was not always joyous when we were growing up. My wife just lost her mother in February. I lost my mother-in-law. The boys lost their grandmother. And Christmas is different this year. But like the Queen, we can still have joy because we know that we are going to meet them. That this world is not all that there is. That there's a better world that's coming. And there will come at the return of Jesus Christ a reunion that will echo in the heavens for millions and millions of years when we see our loved ones again. When we all are gathered together in that city whose streets are called. Because God has given us a gift of a forever family. Maybe for a little while we may not see them, but soon and very soon we'll celebrate again. The gifts keep giving grace, intimacy, a forever family. Fourthly, God gives us tools. God gives us tools. Ephesians 4 says this, when Jesus ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What are those gifts? Those gifts are tools, spiritual gifts. Now when I got, before I got there, I had two tools. I had a hammer, and I had a Phillips head screwdriver. That's all that I had. What I could do was very, very limited. I could not fix a light fixture with a hammer. And I had been dumb enough as a child to know what happened when you put a screwdriver in an outlet. But that's all I had. Now again, my mother-in-law, it's a lot about my mother-in-law this year, 
Uh, she thought that any husband of her daughter better have some tools. I think she assumed if I had the tools, I would do something with them. Well, that's a whole other story. But that's what I got as a wedding gift. I got a blue toolbox full of all the practical tools. And that is the toolbox that I have carried with me through the 23 years we've been married. And over time, I actually learned how to use those tools. You know, I have fixed light fixtures, I have fixed fans, I have put computers together, I have worked on my car. Something I never could have done without the tools. And God realizes that we're to do what He wants us to do, if we are to be the people He wants us to be, if we are to have an impact upon the world, we needed to have tools too. And Ephesians says he gave us those gifts. They're spiritual gifts. All of those different things that God gives to us are to be used for our forever family. To, to be used for the, for the work of the gospel. Some people have hospitality. Some people can teach. Some people can lead. Some people can pray. There are as many tools as there are as many needs in the kingdom. God, and he gives them to you and I. Practical gifts. Somebody has to wash the dishes after coffee hour. Somebody has to vacuum the floor of the church. Someone has to wrangle the kids together to do the Christmas program. Somebody has to sit in the consistory and council room. God has given you a toolbox and unique and special for each of you, so that you will use them to build up the body of Christ, to build up the family, to build up the church, to build up his kingdom. Now, it would have been pretty stupid of me if I had taken the toolbox from my mother-in-law and put it in a closet and never used it again. First of all, she would have asked me, because she's always like to come over to my house and fix something or do something, would have been pretty, uh, pretty sad if I had shown up with my old hammer and screwdriver alone. I had to open them. I had to look at them. I had to figure out how a socket set worked, metric and the real ones. You know, I didn't realize that there were different kinds of pliers and different kinds of screwdrivers and screws and bolts and all of those things. It was a process where I learned to use the tools, but now. I could still change the light bulb. But the point is, God wants you to take those tools and to use them. And sometimes you may not use them perfectly at first, but with practice, with time, the tools that he gives you are going to be a blessing not only to you, but to other people. It quite literally is the gift that keeps on giving. So he gives us grace, the power to live the Christian life. He gives us the, the gift of himself, Emmanuel, intimacy. He gives us a forever family to love here and to love later. He's given us the tools we need to serve him and one another. And the last thing, of course, he has always got to kind of say it's the best for last. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the last of the gifts that I'm going to talk about this morning. And I'm sitting there scratching my head, sitting in my chair and saying, okay, I've kind of tied in the the various gifts, to the practical gifts that I have gotten throughout my life. How in the world am I going to talk about the Holy Spirit? And so I'm sitting at my desk and I look over, sitting underneath my lake lamp, is really one of the best gifts I've gotten in recent years. An Alexa. I love my Alexa. For those of you who don't know, Alexa is a little circular thing that sits wherever you want and you can talk to it. I bought one 
for my parents. My father, some days, has a better relationship with Alexa than he does with my mother. She goes, you talk to her more than you talk to me. But it's true. I wondered at first when I got it, it was just kind of a gimmicky little thing. I like gadgets. But I find myself going throughout the day, having conversations with this little inanimate uh, circle on my desk. I will ask it a question. I get an answer back. What's the weather today, Alexa? She'll give me that. I'll say, Alexa, set a timer so I can uh, make sure to pick the pizza out of the oven. I will ask it to play music. I'll ask it to tell me a joke. I will ask it to make meow sounds so my cats get all freaked out. But Alexa has become a very useful gift for me because it helps me navigate some of the things in life. And I remember what Jesus said to his disciples. In the night in which he was betrayed, the night in which he was to be arrested, right before his crucifixion, he tells them, I am going to send you the Holy Spirit. Don't be troubled, don't be anxious, because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is going to guide you into what you need to know. The Holy Spirit is going to show you things you do not understand. And the Holy Spirit is going to be the one who helps you follow me. To answer your questions. To remind you of what the scriptures say. To draw you back when you get distracted. To comfort you when you are sorrowing. To remind you that I am with you. I know it's an imperfect analogy. You know, certainly no uh, technology from Amazon you know, can really fully encompass what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit really it, it is kind of all of these things. Because it's the Holy Spirit that, that gives us God's grace. He is the, the connection between God and our lives. He is the one who's the conduit of grace. He is the one who, who fosters the intimacy. Jesus says, when I go away, I'm going to send another comforter who will be with you. It is, it is the Holy Spirit that reminds us in our grief and sorrow that we are part of a larger family. And in our grief and sorrow that that family is a family that goes on forever and ever. Amen. And we call them the gifts of the Spirit. Spiritual gifts for a reason. Because he is the one who instructs us in how to use those tools. How to be the people that God wants us to be. So the Holy Spirit really is the, the greatest of all the sock and underwear gifts. And true, like sock and underwear, we kind of forget about it. We don't rank that very high. Sometimes we think about what God has given us at Christmas. But when you need it, He's always going to be there. He's going to be the answer to every question that you have. He's going to be the, the strength in the midst of whatever weakness overwhelms you. He is going to be the one that is going to show you how to, to love this forever family and to serve our, our God and King. So the gifts of God at Christmas keep on giving but there is more than just the, the hope and the peace and the joy and the love. There, there's so much more. We've only scratched the surface this morning. But these practical gifts, these useful gifts, are as necessary as any of the others. You know, you may not always get what you want. You may ask God. For something that God says is not right for you. You may plead with God for something that he knows in the long run is not good for you. You know, God is not an indulgent grandfather. He is king of kings, lord of lords. He knows more than we will ever know. He knows the beginning from the end. So you may not always get what you want. But the good news of Christmas is this. Is that God will always give you what you need when you need it. And it's 
exactly in the proportion for what you absolutely need. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all of the gifts of Christmas. Not just the big ones that come to mind and the carols that we sing or the sermons that we hear, but these socks and underwear gifts as well that kind of go unnoticed. Yet without them, we would not be able to live life in the way that you want us to live. Father, help us to be energized today by a, a fresh infusion of grace. Help us to celebrate Emmanuel not only at Christmas, but your presence with us every day. Remind us that we have brothers and sisters who we can depend upon and who depend upon us. And even through the grave, we will be reunited again. Help us to learn to use the tools that you have given to us, specific to our callings. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for embodying all of these and being the one that ties it all together. <coughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we thank you for Christmas. We thank you for the gifts. We thank you for forever. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are going to, uh, to close kind of where we began with the song of, of angels. I invite you to uh, to join your voices together as we sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
Indeed, God has given us many, many gifts. And we have an opportunity at this time to return some of those gifts to the work of His kingdom here in this world. We receive our morning offering. each one just the right amount in just the right time. Father, you have blessed us, and so we want to be a blessing to others. Take the gifts that we offer this morning, multiply them, that others might hear the good news, the Savior has come. It is in his name we offer these gifts. Thank you. 